Marissa, can you confirm the slides in the recording? Um, yes, James, we can see your slides and I can see that the meeting has been is being recorded. Thank you very much. So this is the second lecture in today's series. And like I said before, um, this becomes the this becomes the 15th one, uh, which means we have four more lectures to go to complete the program. So this is focusing on sensor science and, and health. And by way of introduction, uh, ideally these lectures uh, were prepared with the idea in mind that they will come first uh, as motivational lectures and then followed by those that are much inclined towards methodology and practical aspects. But we, as you know, we have to change the structure later on uh, and they are now coming last. So sensor science, as we know, brings together a number of disciplines that includes physiology, chemistry, statistics, um, food science, of course, it's a sub-discipline of food science, anthropology, and, and the natural sciences, biology, uh, physics, all come together to try and understand human responses, consumers' responses to foods, when they consume them, when they see them, when they buy them. So uh, we're trying to understand how sensor perception influences uh, our choices. In this diagram, uh, I suppose you was trying to explain or to demonstrate how difficult and complex sensor perception is. Like I said before, perception differs or perceptions differ from one person to another. They are not static because they are a product of the input from the environment. When we get the stimulus through our senses, it's taken to the brain and then interpreted in all sorts of ways, depending on our previous experiences, on our culture and uh, other factors. So the implication of that is to say that um, Now my my pointer is high, is, is hidden here. Anyway, I'll use just the pointer. I can't see the last. So I was saying the implication is that uh, I'll give an example based on, on, on this picture that we see. People or consumers can look at one food, for example, and they have different judgments about it for example test the same drink same concentration different people can have different perceptions about it someone can say it tastes too sweet someone it tastes sweet some someone says it's dilute it is tasteless or it, it has low test intensity so that is perception people uh, understand or decode the information from products in different ways. One product, different interpretations. That is one example. Another example in relation to this picture of the elephant that we are seeing here is different products, one interpretation. I'll give an example again. For example, there are mayonnaise or yogurts or any product where fat has been reduced, but with the goal of maintaining the fat uh, sensation or the cream sensation, you'll find out the other one is they've added, for example, some carbohydrate um, uh, fat replacers, whereas the other one is real fat. But consumers, when the product is well designed, they may perceive the product the same. In other words, they may see no differences between 
the two. Yet only it is the product developer who knows that in this one there's fat, in the other one there's a fat replacer. So that's our perception, sensor perception important. That's how important it is in terms of sensor science, in terms of uh, uh, marketing, and in terms of uh, food product development. So we need to understand perception so that we can be able to make the products that we want. Now, the master classes, I said before, uh, under Dr. Ina, were supposed to have eight uh, lectures. Four of them have already been presented, and what is remaining are four that we are presenting next week. So, the intention, uh, of course, is to show the interrelatedness of sensor science. As you can see here, on the left, we have the natural sciences and technology. They focus more on the product, product characterization, product engineering, product development. Uh, whereas when you look at the right, the behavioral sciences, the humanities, the social sciences, they focus more on the person, the person's responses, the consumer's responses to the product. So what we see in between is sensor science. In other words, it is an interdisciplinary uh, field. It is an interdisciplinary subject combining not only what is shown in the picture, but as we've said um, earlier on, including other uh, disciplines like statistics as well. So related to the topic sensor science and health is the aspect of sensory nutrition. And this is a research, um, uh, a research area that examines how sensations affects what an animal eats and what the consequences of that which is eaten are in terms of nutrition and health. So it seems that sensory nutrition is gaining a lot of momentum nowadays, considering that infectious diseases, uh, although they are still around, we have COVID-19 now, they are in decreasing. While least, um, diet-related non-communicable diseases are on the increase, especially in, in, in Africa as well. So sensory nutrition becomes important. So it comes into picture uh, given the fact that human foods have become hyperpalatable. They have been so engineered, so made to an extent that you cannot resist them. You have to put a lot of effort to, to resist eating uh, modern foods. Yet, unfortunately, most of them will be uh, processed or manufactured in a manner that they are not health. In as much as they are hyper palatable, they are not uh, health, uh, health promoting. So it is uh, one of the goals of the InnoFood Africa project to ensure that those food products, especially plant-based food products, that are considered more nutritious are also transformed into palatable, uh, healthy promoting foods so that even the consumers can actually uh, go for them. So we start with a global perspective, how uh, obesity as an example uh, comes about. You will notice that this lecture will be more like a case study using obesity. We see that we start with a lean person, and then the person has lean adipose tissue, and then progression to obese adipose or fat tissue, and then the person is now obese. The factors involved there, of course, there is overnutrition, there is sedentary lifestyle, there is genetic uh, susceptibility. And uh, we see that in a healthy state, where the person is lean, there is high proportions or concentration in the body of anti-inflammatory uh, compounds or metabolites, high proportions of antioxidants, high proportions of insulin, uh, uh, sorry, high insulin sensitivity, which means insulin regulation is intact. And there is also high angiogenesis, the formation of new veins, blood vessels, in a proper and healthy way is, uh, is ensured. But as we go towards 
obesity, as we increase fatty tissue, as we become obese, anti-inflammation changes to inflammation. We start to feel inflamed. We start to experience oxidative stress. We start to have insulin resistance and dysfunctional um, uh, um, regeneration of blood uh, vessels. So obesity is really a global pandemic. I hope um, all of us would agree on that. We used to think of it as a Western uh, scourge, <coughs> but nowadays, even in Africa, especially in urbanized uh, places and in towns and cities, obesity is also on the rise. So food is the single most important factor for death. Actually, uh, in one of the papers by some South African authors, they have, uh, referring to sugar, they have described it as a chronic toxin because it is one of the contributors to, to some of these diet-related diseases. So the foods that we eat, while it's the nourish our bodies, they have also the potential to cause harm to us in the short or in the long term over a long period of time through uh, diseases like cancer, diseases like uh, diabetes mellitus, diseases like uh, overweight and obesity. Now in this figure, we see the mortality rate attributed to diet uh, together with the number of deaths at the global level attributed to, to diet. In the center, we see the risk factors that are causing death. I'll start on the top. We see that diet high in sodium is the one that has the highest number of deaths globally. So it's a global phenomenon at, <coughs> at a world level. And that is followed, uh, uh, of course, if we go to the key, the red is cardiovascular diseases. So we see that salt or sodium is being related to cardiovascular diseases. And uh, the next one is type two diabetes. So there is a concern in terms of diet, as we all know. And then diet low in whole grains, again, cardiovascular diseases. And when you look on the left, um, according to this key, in terms of location, we have high to middle SDI, which is social demographic index. The higher the social demographic index, the highly industrialized uh, a country is, a region is. So what it means is uh, countries which have high social demographic industries, good economies, well-developed economies, they tend to suffer a lot from uh, diet-related diseases that are caused by high sodium in the diet. And one of the diseases, of course, is cardiovascular diseases followed by type 2 <coughs> diabetes. A lot of factors, as you can see, diet low in vegetables, diet low in nuts, uh, diet low in calcium, all these contributing to the mortalities that we see. In terms of low to middle income countries, the blue uh, box, we see as well here yeah, that <coughs> diet low in whole grains is being implicated in the etiology of cardiovascular diseases, uh, much even higher than in um, high income countries, just to give an example. I'm sure you'll get through this information when we share the, the slides. It's a lot of information. Right, now, when you look at this diagram, uh, it, looks, it looks at Ethiopia. Now from here, the next three or so slides are focusing on the four countries in the Inno Food uh, Africa project, Ethiopia, South Africa, Uganda, and Kenya. We see here that uh, uh, food-related diseases are on the rise. Child wasting is even higher than um, unsafe water sources. Uh, there's high blood pressure. Uh, there's high blood sugar, there's obesity. But of concern for Ethiopia, which has been highlighted, is standing and wasting. Standing is actually topping. And uh, uh, 
the child wasting is actually topping and standing is coming second, which shows a diet that is chronically low in protein and energy. And of course, this is what this picture is trying to, to, to show. So there is need to transform our diets to ensure that they are healthy. Most of the diets that we are eating, especially convenient foods, they are high in fats, they are high in sugars, they are high in salts, and they are not healthy. And there is need to consider reformulation and to persuade consumers to change their consumption patterns and their food choice uh, behaviors. Now, this is Uganda. <coughs> In Uganda, you see that high blood pressure is of concern, obviously related to uh, blood sugar and, and the blood salt, especially uh, sodium. And when you look at Kenya again, it's a similar pattern, high blood pressure, second from unsafe sex, which is a concern. And at number four, you see that high blood sugar, among us others, and there's obesity. And all these factors point to the need for changing the food systems to ensure that diets, African diets, are much healthier and promote good health and well-being. And that cannot be achieved without paying attention to the role of sensor science in the formulation of products that will be more acceptable to people, but also health, uh, health promoting. Now, this is South Africa. We see high blood pressure number two, uh, high blood sugar number two, high blood pressure, obesity, the three risk factors coming after the other. Topping up is a um, risk factors for death in South Africa, according to the 2017 data. So it seems that, or it has actually been confirmed through research, mostly from uh, the economic side, that when incomes go up, there is a tendency to increase the intake of salt, sugars, fats in the diet. One would assume that when there's more money, people have money to buy fruits and vegetables to enhance their diets. But the reality on the ground shows that as you increase incomes, people tend to buy more convenient foods. And unfortunately, those convenient foods uh, uh, are less balanced uh, as of now in terms of health. So that's about obesity. and. Uh, it is a, a measure of an adult's weight in relationship to his uh, or her height. Obesity trends among as the U.S. Uh, adults. In this picture, I think with three or more uh, slides that are coming, we will see that in 1985, obesity was very low in the U.S. There was no data in some parts of the country, and uh, there was the data, the statistics showed less than 10% in others and 10 to 14 in other can, in other parts of US, as we can see. <coughs> but with time, 1986, you see that the map keeps changing and becoming much blue and blue and increasing in the intensity of blueness because now it's 1991. It's now over 14 percent in terms of uh, obesity and it's covering almost the whole country 1992 1993 1994 the whole country uh, if you sample you find some people who are obese uh, so that's not good news actually it may, it points to a need to change the the food systems and food consumption patterns 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2001 is now over 24%. So the next diagram shows obesity trends from 2002 onwards. And the same pattern as we can see. The more intense it becomes, it means the pattern is increasing. And this is prevalence of self-reported obesity among its U.S. adults from 2011. <coughs> so 
So the more intense it becomes, uh, the increase it is becoming in terms of um, obesity uh, in the territories. Now this is 2019. Now this is prevalence of self-reported obesity amongst non-Hispanic black adults by states and territory, 2013 to 2015. It is the same concept that it increases uh, in intensity of the colors, meaning that obesity is increasing from 1994, diabetes is increasing in 1994 to 2015. The last part of the lecture we will look at the need for a diet change in many countries. We're starting with a, a global uh, perspective. But on the global perspective, as we said before, we will look at four countries that are active in the inner food Africa, plus one, uh, uh, I mean four African countries, plus one European countries. And this is the share of adults that are obese from 1975 to 2016. And what we see that the general trend is all of them are going up with South Africa and Norway topping up. And South Africa is actually on the, on the, on, at the top. And Ethiopia, although it is lying low, the trend shows it's also rising along with Uganda and Kenya. And that is a concern. <clears throat> so there is need actually to take action to reverse uh, this tide of things. So it is cheaper for a society to cure malnutrition than actually to cure the consequences of obesity or any other diet related disease for that matter. And like I showed before, this is the share of adults that are obese versus gross domestic product per capita from 1990 to 2016. We see here that as GDP increases, Okay, this is the GDP uh, axis. As the GDP increases, uh, obesity percentage also rises. Uganda, Ethiopia, the trend is up. And Kenya, the trend is up. South Africa from 1990 up to now, the trend is up. As countries become economically much better, there's a tendency to you have an increase in the prevalence of diet related non communicable diseases, especially towards overconsumption. So, this is what I was uh, trying to emphasize here that underweight and overweight in selected developing countries, when we change from severely underweight to underweight to overweight. Uh, you see that it's, it's not the situation is not static. When you put efforts to remove malnutrition in Africa under nutrition, over time, countries and societies and individuals tend to transition to overnutrition, as we can see. Rather than a, a stable and healthy state, there is a flip situation whereby the countries quickly become over nutritious. As the economy is increasingly become much better, there's a lot of surplus money for food, but unfortunately this uh, money is spent on more appealing, less healthy, more attractive foods. Those that are high in fat and sugar and salt and low in uh, uh, bioactives, for example, that promote good nutrition, good health. So the same issues described here, obesity among adults in 2015. Self-reported data and decides whether they are males or females. And we see that obesity was high in the United States and lower in Japan, Korea, Italy, which relates well in terms of the principle of better economics for a country, higher incidence of overconsumption. And we see that it seems that more women, women were more obese than, um, than men. In other words, 
a higher number of women were obese than uh, that of men in most cases. So now in the US, they have calculated that an investment of one dollar per person in food and physical activity will give a payback of five point six dollars in reduced health cost. In other words, when we invest in efforts to eat healthy food and to undertake physical activity, there is a huge, there's significant returns on investment. Now we see here that for those who are overweight, uh, in terms of emergency room costs, they have 22% higher costs compared to a healthy person when you are going for an emergency room. When you get obese, the cost rises. When you become severely obese, it becomes 41%, which means that an unhealthy condition is actually a cost to an individual and it's a cost to society as well. And that's what uh, this slide was trying to explain. And this is this on the right. You see that there is five year return on investment on ten dollar per person community based investment. Uh, it's showing the same principle to say if we take the right actions and uh, there will be uh, some return on investment on that. Now towards the end annually, the five big hospitals in Norway gets about 130 to 1350 billion. So this is about budget in 2019. What this figure shows is that each time from 2003 to 2040 as a prediction, the budget given to hospitals keep rising. Uh, that is the, the, green, the green line. The, the budget for hospitals, the green line, whereas the national budget as well is rising, but it is even failing to meet the budget for the hospitals. So why is it that the budget for the hospitals is increasing? Obviously, of course, one reason is uh, infectious diseases, but also the non-communicable diet related uh, non-communicable diseases that are on the rise, that are straining the health systems and therefore their budgets get increasing every time. And countries try to increase the share that they give to hospitals, but they're failing to catch up, which means these are the consequences of unhealthy diets. But sensor science can have a role to play in trying to manage such a situation. So like we said before, there are lots of diet-related non-communicable diseases. Some of them are listed here, skin inflammations, gut inflammations, stroke, uh, diabetes, type 2, cancer, obesity, among us others. And uh, this is the same concept which is being explained here. To say in the UK, the caloric intake has been reduced by 20%, but and physical activity is at the same level. But ex obesity has explored. It is the food composition and the food habits that has changed. So what has changed? There's more liquid sugar in the drinks, more fast carbohydrates, you know, highly metabolizable carbohydrates. There's less milk, there's more milk products with added sugar, there's less vegetables, but more fruit, and there's more ultra processed foods. So all these things, although policy efforts are being put to reduce the impact of <clears throat> non-communicable diseases, Unfortunately, uh, obesity keeps rising because of most of these uh, uh, factors. So uh, biologically, we are made to collect energy and save it in terms of uh, plant and then use it in terms of need, like in terms of drought, in terms of food shortage. But nowadays we know that there's excess food around. When there's one, there's hunger, and drought in one country, food is shipped from other countries. So there's no shortage and that keeps driving. There's over supply of energy and that keeps driving um, uh, obesity up. Mechanism to prevent us from losing weight. Uh, there are a lot of them. Normally, most of them are hormones secreted in the body to control um, <clears throat> our appetite, to control our satiation. 
uh, all those are mechanisms that help to prevent us losing weight. Um, allow me to skip on this one. Right, so hypothesis. These are hypotheses about factors that may influence satiety and ideas for new foods. And incidentally, most of these factors, we are already studying them in our universities. Uh, I can confirm this at the University of Pretoria. For example, uh, slow fat digestion releases satiety hormones. So there is a conception to say if we target the hormonal control uh, of, of food consumption, we can actually influence satiation so that the person feels full uh, before he or she can consume more by inhibiting certain hormones that are associated with the, the food digestion process in the GIT. And some of these hormones, I'm not going to get into detail of them, are listed here. And the next hypothesis is delayed gastric emptying increases satiation. And of course, uh, this is one research area that uh, in our department we're looking at, um, because based on the fact that more fibrous, more dietary fiber in the in, in, in the food is likely to delay gastric emptying and a sense of fullness means one can stay longer without feeling hungry and that reduces the frequency of eating as an example. Now the third concept is about slow digestion and it works via blood glucose and I'm, I'm aware that some people are working on this mechanism. Uh, I, I, I guess they are using one of the techniques is to use phenolics to combine them with starch so that you store, you regulate the digestion of starch and then you regulate the release of glucose. And there are questions as well, research questions about the use of proteins in, in trying to uh, regulate food consumption, energy intake in order to increase uh, healthiness of diets. So availability must be dealt with. It's another issue that must be dealt with. If you want to improve health, make foods that are healthy available because it is too easy to choose sweet and fatty foods. And um, sugar is cheap is one of the examples. But the challenge is the low energy foods are often boring. Foods that are healthy or low in energy, they tend to bore, sensorially speaking. Sweet is a genetic preference. In as much as we can manipulate uh, foods during design, some people have genes that specify preference for certain uh, sweet test levels, for example, and uh, that would be difficult for them to accept. It's discontinuous variation compared to continuous variation. So there is comfort in sweet foods. For example, when people are not feeling well, uh, they tend to like sweet. It is not pleasant to be hungry. When you feel hungry, you want to eat something. You can't ignore hunger. And obviously by eating, you are adding calories to your body, contributing to overweight and obesity. So those are some of the challenges. And our unconscious psychology does not allow our cognitive ambitions to be in charge. In other words, although we have the knowledge about what to do to be healthy, what to eat, what not to eat, Sometimes our pleasure principle, remember we talked about uh, hedonism, uh, what we like as an affect tend to override the, the conscious, the, that aspect which is controlled by a decision, by informed knowledge. So those are the challenges. And with that, uh, I would like to say thank you. Can we have questions if uh, there are any? Thank you very much, James. Um, if there are any questions for James, you can please um, type in the chat box or you can raise your hand.
Uh, yes, Marisa, it seems uh, we don't have questions uh, for now. I think with the permission of the group, I can stop the recording, but I see I see Oyemi posted something. Just thinking about the low energy food being boring. OK. Uh, Yemi, I, I, I think. By the low energy food being boring. The idea that is being expressed is to say that. Biologically. Uh, sweetness is associated or is designed to lead people towards energy dense food so that they get energy for survival. So when you reduce uh, sweetness. Again, when you are reducing energy, which is good for health, but also from a sensory perspective, you are making the food less sweet and less appealing. And in that sense, it becomes boring. Uh, because remember, there is an argument that says that uh, uh, sweetness is a, one, a genetic trait, two, a trait that is enhanced right from inside the womb. In other words, consumers, human beings are exposed to sweetness in utero when they're still in the bodies of their mothers. So they are socialized already before they come on Earth to such an extent that it is a stronger impulse that is difficult to defeat, although we are trying. So when you reduce sweetness uh, intensity, it seems that the the food becomes boring. I, I think that is the concept that uh, we wanted to convey here. So probably this is another reason why, uh, not probably, but in actual fact, why industry has decided to uh, revert to artificial sweeteners. Because now you maintain the sweetness, the sweet test, but you lower the the, the energy content, uh, for example. But they're also concerned with that. Remember, it's, it becomes a way, an issue of weighing the, the advantages and disadvantages. I see a question from Nomzamo says, uh, how can we as food scientists demystify technological methods, e.g. fat replaces, fat replacers as consumers think we add chemicals to food? <laughs> so now th th this is a, this is an interesting, important question, but a difficult one nonetheless. The task is on our shoulders to, to demystify this. I think by using information, knowledge sharing, uh, maybe even outreach programs, because it's all about access to the facts of the matter. So we have a long way to go on this one. I think it relates to uh, food technology neophobia and food neophobia as well. So it's an interesting question. I don't have a straight answer, but it's a concern. We need to keep putting more and more efforts and sometimes to show the evidence that these things are actually not chemicals in the sense of chemicals, but they are actually for our good. Um, does that mean that it is the pregnant woman eats a lot of paper, then the baby when born can eat paper as much as the mom? Interesting question. So obviously not not in exactly like that, not, ex not exactly like a copycat situation, but research has shown that exposure increases the likelihood of liking that stimulus uh, in life going forward. So it, yes, it means that if the mother is uh, a propensity to like uh, what chilies, paper, such flavors, 
the baby is getting those flavors through the amniotic fluid and through the umbilical cord and uh, after being born through the milk and already he she is being socialized into those tests and uh, there is a higher probability that the child will have a higher acceptance of those flavors in the diet compared to one who has not been accept, uh, exposed to such flavors before. Um, Um, James, I see there's another question in the chat. Uh, can you read it for me, Marisa? Do I see it? Um, I think it's the same, you know, it's the same person. I mean, adapt to eating it as a toddler, hence the mother sugar containing diet affect the child in life, even if the child chooses not to take high sugar food. Okay. Um, I mean, adapt to eating it as toddler. Yes, the mom sugar containing diet affects the child in life, even if the child chooses not to take high sugar foods. So uh, this is why I said this is not a yes or no question, uh, because as we have been explaining through other uh, lecture series, the ultimate decision on food choice is an interplay between the decisions that are conscious in the mind and the affect, if you have been following previous uh, lectures. In other words, the likings, the cravings of the person is opposed to the conscious decisions of what is the health, what do you like, plus also the cultural exposure, plus also the physiological exposures, which we are talking about in utero, uh, and early on in life as a toddler, because it is the mother who is uh, determining the food environment in the family. So all those factors coming together uh, makes the decision to choose healthy foods very difficult. Uh, I'm trying to address the last point where you say, even if the child chooses, I'm putting an emphasis on the word chooses, even if the child chooses, not to take high sugar foods. Most of us, most of the people are trying to choose not to take high sugar foods, high fatty foods, high salty foods. They, they know the advantages, but the reality is that uh, it's a long story. There's been cultural influences. There's been previous influences that they have got to fight and contend with and overcome before they stick strongly with a choice to choose uh, 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 low sugar foods, for example. So the awareness is there, but how do you make the choices easy? That is something else. And this is where research is uh, trying to grapple with nowadays. People are researching on food environments, for example, uh, to say maybe if we change the food environment, what happens in the restaurants and in the kitchen, uh, we can help people make uh, better decisions. And um, any other question, Marisa? I think if we don't have questions, any more questions? Uh, no. Seems as if we are, if there's no more questions, I think if anyone has more questions, you can contact James um, via email and um, take the discussion further. Thank you, thank you, uh, Marissa. Thank you, colleagues, for attending. Uh, let me stop the recording now. We meet next week uh, for the next lecture series. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Thanks, everyone, for attending.